Amen. So many places other people are think they're enjoying right now, but you know they don't know where you can go and and be have more peace than you can right here in God's house. Amen. So. Amen. Let's grab a hymn. We'll turn to 379. 379. Brethren, we have met to worship. First, second, and last. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Brethren, see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe. Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. All right, fellowship with your neighbor for a little while. Glad to see you out tonight. Good evening. Good to see everyone in church tonight. Thank you for being here and for being faithful to the house of the Lord this evening. Let me take uh, just a few moments to address several prayer objects that are on our hearts tonight and different items that uh, we need to be remembering. Um, let me begin with the announcement pertaining to uh, Brother John Geyser's father, uh, who passed away Monday afternoon, uh, Monday late morning, early afternoon. Uh, the visitation and funeral service will not be until next Saturday, which will be August the 12th. And so again, on Saturday, August the 12th, and the details of uh, those arrangements uh, will be announced on Sunday and, and even announced again uh, via a one call 
uh, but it is at a funeral home in Lancaster, South Carolina. Um, and again, please continue to pray for that family. I have asked repeatedly if there's anything that we can do as a church, any way that we can love on them by way of even bringing food or uh, something along those lines, as, as we often do here in the South. That's part of our culture. Uh, in um, You love somebody, you, you bring them something to eat. And uh, there's nothing wrong with any of that either, um, especially at a time where there has been a death because that's the last thing that someone needs to be having to worry about is uh, cooking a meal or preparing food or anything along those lines. But uh, as I have asked repeatedly, um, there is not a need right now for such, but if you would please continue to pray for that family. Uh, I want you also to pray for uh, Tammy Welchel's daughter, Elena, who is at home sick tonight. And uh, as a result, Ms. Tammy's not here and several of those that she brings with her on Wednesdays, uh, not able to be with us. We have uh, other folks who are vacationing this week. Uh, Rodney and Danielle and their children are out of town on vacation. So pray for that family tonight. Ms. Kathy's gonna be uh, going on a trip soon. We wanna pray for her safety as she journeys to parts uh, west of here um, into the, the foreign country of Tennessee. Uh, so you pray for her. Uh, absolute best thing that ever came out of Tennessee is I-40 East. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you pray for Miss Kathy as she goes uh, on that trip and, uh, and others again that are uh, traveling uh, in the coming days. I want you also please to continue to pray for Jaden Robert Robinson uh, Jaden Robinson, this is Miss Jane Barnhill's great-grandson. He is three years old. Uh, he spent some time in Children's Hospital last week, um, wound up having to have uh, a surgical procedure, a, a non-invasive procedure necessarily, but nonetheless, uh, when you're three years old and you're having something uh, done uh, that is... Uh, pretty serious based on a lot of what he's been experiencing. I want you to pray for that little boy right now uh, and for uh, all matters pertaining to him. I also want you to continue to pray uh, for Brother Conrad. It's good to see Brother Conrad back in service tonight. And, and Miss Sylvia also, uh, I know there was a doctor's appointment today for Miss Sylvia. Am I correct on that? And so please continue to pray for her and for Brother Conrad with some health issues with which he has been dealing. Um, I want you also please to uh, remember our missionaries tonight as you pray, and specifically a missionary couple that you have yet to meet, uh, but that we have been supporting since January of this year. Uh, Brother Todd and Miss Amy Bell, missionaries to the state of Maine. Um, I want you to pray for them as uh, sometime yesterday, uh, Miss Amy was cleaning uh, the baptistry at the church that they have planted. They've been there in Maine for 27 years and have planted seven churches in that time uh, in the state of Maine. And what that literally means is that from the ground up, that they have gone into a town or into a community, began witnessing, began leading folks to the Lord, began building a church, and then literally building a building and uh, bringing into it uh, items that are necessary, and one of those even being a, a baptistry. And so Miss Amy was cleaning the baptistry and slipped and um, did some pretty major damage to her back. Uh, she has been in excruciating pain since that, was in the emergency room for several hours last night, uh, was on her way to a doctor's appointment today to determine whether or not she's going to have to have some surgery as either discs are uh, hitting one another or discs are um, pinching nerves and maybe even the spinal column. 
So please, if you would, pray for Todd and Amy Bell tonight. And then I am sure that by now, uh, many, if not all of you, uh, have heard the news concerning Miss Catherine Fannin and what went on uh, yesterday morning. Uh, it seems as if it's, it's been more days than that, but uh, yesterday morning, Miss Catherine went in for what was supposed to be a surgery on the cancer on her arm, and as the doctors uh, then were getting in there and looking at everything, they determined that there was not a need for a surgery, that the radiation had done everything that it needed to do. They took a biopsy, and they are going to continue to monitor it, uh, but she got to come home uh, not even having to have surgery as such. That is a huge answer to prayer, and to God be the glory for what he has done in Miss Catherine's life. So please continue to pray for her, but rejoice along with her tonight in what the Lord has done for her. Special spoken objects of prayer that are on your hearts this evening. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Someone else, another special spoken object of prayer, uh, praise report, even tonight. Tanya? Appreciate you praying for Tanya's father, Roger Stevens, if you'd remember him in your prayers. Bless you. Anyone else? Any other prayer objects tonight? After the service uh, this evening, uh, if you're a member of the Buildings and Grounds Committee, if you just kind of hang loose for about 10 minutes as we need to discuss something uh, pertaining to what has gone on uh, outside and what will need to happen even for this coming Lord's Day because uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most everybody has seen that something's a little different out in the parking lot tonight than when you were here on Sunday. And uh, we have been told that uh, truly it would be better if we could even stay off of it until Monday or Tuesday of next week. And so as a result of that, we're going to get a little bit of a game plan together with buildings and grounds and, uh, and a few folks as to what we're going to do Sunday morning and Sunday night in getting people into the building in a, a very safe manner. Uh, so buildings and grounds, if you would just hang loose for a few minutes after the service tonight. Any other special spoken objects of prayer or uh, items that are on your hearts this evening? I am confident that we all have unspoken objects that we would mention just by raising our hands tonight. Uh, the Lord certainly knows uh, what those are, and he is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we would ask or think because we serve a prayer-hearing, prayer-answering God who invites us to cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. Would you join with me in the altar tonight as we bring these requests to the Lord this evening? And I'm going to do something just a little bit different tonight. Jacob, if you would come to the pulpit and would you lead us in prayer this evening, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and everything that you've done for us. We pray for everyone who's not feeling well, Miss Catherine Fannin, Miss Sylvia Davis, and others. 
We thank you for saving us. And we pray that everything would go well in this service tonight. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. 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 As you are on your way back to your seats and as you pick up your copy of the Word of God tonight, let me invite you to turn with me in the New Testament to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1 tonight. And we will begin reading in verse number 2 uh, in just a few moments. We'll dive into that verse I also invite you to follow along with a study guide. There was one on the stand in the back of the sanctuary this evening, should you need one. When we last studied from this portion of Scripture, we noted the meaning of several different words or phrases found in 1 Peter 1.1. We saw that the strangers to whom Peter is writing are ones who he refers to, the believers, I'm sorry, who Peter uh, writes to, uh, are ones he refers to as strangers. Strangers has the meaning of living alongside the heathen. How many of you remember that from last Wednesday night? Living alongside the heathen. Uh, With all due respect, I I wonder how many of us ever feel like that we are living alongside the heathen in our world today? We also found that these strangers have been scattered and dispersed throughout the various regions and locations mentioned in verse number one. All of these places are in modern day Turkey. Uh, Those areas that were being discussed, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, All of those are in the country of modern-day Turkey. We concluded our study last Wednesday night with the understanding that even though these believers are living alongside the heathen, and even though they have been scattered and persecuted by those who wish to see Christianity destroyed, they have not, nor will they ever be, forsaken or forgotten by God. And I I want to stress that even tonight where we are concerned. At times we feel as if, yes, we are living among the heathen. At times we feel as if we have been dispersed and scattered abroad. And on occasions we may even believe that we're the only ones left, like Elijah felt. But I need to remind you of something tonight God has never forgotten us, and God will never forsake us. He is taking care of his own. He always has, and he always will. And it brings us to where we will begin tonight in 1 Peter 1, 2. Follow along with me as we look at these words quickly. The Word of God says, "...elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit." unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Boy, what a a power-packed verse with all kinds of doctrinal truth to unpack. When we look at this verse tonight and even at your study guide, I want you to look first at the sovereign's generosity at the sovereign's generosity. And it's here that we begin to deal with a number of important doctrines that are found in the Word of God. It's also where we find that a great number of people are very concerned and very confused, I might say, concerning the use and meaning of biblical terms. 
We've got a lot of people in our world today that are very confused about the use and meaning of certain biblical terms. The, the words that we've read in verse 2 should not frighten us at all. Specifically, the, the first word of verse 2 should not alarm those that read it. Moreover, it should cause an individual to realize exactly how, lo- how loving, how gracious, and how merciful God has been toward sinful humanity. I want to point something out to everyone tonight, and I pray that you get plugged in to what I'm trying to give you this evening. Were it not for the mercy and grace of a loving God, I'm going to say it again to you tonight, were it not for the mercy and grace of a loving God, we would either already be in hell or we would be headed to hell. Because, again, the truth is that without the mercy and grace of God, we are headed to hell. It's all about God giving to us what we do not deserve. When we look at these words that are used specifically in verse number 2, the important teachings behind the doctrines of election and foreknowledge is that God, in His sovereignty and in His mercy, looked down through the corridors of time and saw our need for a Savior, He sent His Son, Jesus, and He chose to save all who would believe on His name. Did you hear me tonight? That God saw our need for a Savior. Stop right there and say amen. He saw our need for a Savior. He sent Jesus, and Brother Chris, Jesus willingly went and you, you and I were on such the same page the other night when, when you had the choir sing the song about how that uh, a search was made in heaven to find one that was willing to go. That's the one part of that song with which I do disagree because no search was made because there's only one that is willing and able to go. Jesus Christ is the only one that could pay our sin debt. So again, get this understanding tonight that God looked down through the corridors of time, saw our need for a Savior, that Jesus came, and that God still in the year 2023 is willing to save all who will call upon His name. I'm thankful tonight, and I will continue to preach a whosoever will gospel because that's what the Word of God preaches and teaches to us. But just because God knows who will be saved and who will remain lost in their sins does not mean that He only chose to save some and leave others lost. I pray that you hear me clearly tonight. Just because God knows. And and does God know who will be saved? Yes. Yes. God is omniscient. He knows all. But just because he knows who will be saved and who will be lost does not mean that he chose to save some and that he chooses to leave others in their lost condition. That is not what the Word of God teaches. That is not the heart of my Father in heaven. And I want to give you verses that will remind us of that truth. Because in Romans 10, 13, and you're going to hear this verse from me again very soon, but Romans 10, 13 reminds us, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, I am thankful tonight that whosoever includes me. Whosoever included you. Whosoever includes whosoever will call upon his name. You don't have to be of this nationality, this ethnicity, this economic bracket. You don't have to be of this religious persuasion. No, ladies and gentlemen, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not only do we find it in Romans 10, 13, but we also look in 2 Peter 3, 9, and we learn the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, 
And then look at this last phrase, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, tonight, we ought to be people who pause and who praise the Lord that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, let me stop right there, and I need you to hear me very clearly, and I need you to hear me very carefully tonight. When we read the verse, especially from 2 Peter 3, 9, that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, does that mean that all will come to repentance? No, it does not. Because God is a perfect gentleman, and he will not force his salvation on those who choose to reject it. He will not. Look at it in Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You say, Pastor, I, I'm still just a little bit confused maybe, or I'm not quite clear on what all of this means concerning God inviting whosoever will. Well, let me clear it up in perhaps the most familiar verse in the Word of God and the one that follows it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at it in verse number 17 of John chapter 3. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. As we move on, you'll notice that verse 2 even contains the work of the Trinity in connection with the salvation of the sinner. Look back at at 1 Peter 1 verse 2, and there we learn that we have the election by the Father, we have the sanctification of the Spirit, And Brother Larry, we even have the blood of the Son mentioned all right there in that same verse. Here we see that the Father planned it, that the Spirit presents it, and that the Son is the one who purchased it. Don't let any of that confuse you. Don't let any of that trouble you tonight. I'm thankful that we have a God who planned it, The Spirit presents it and the Son purchased it so that you and I can make heaven our home so that we would not have to go to hell, but we could have our sins forgiven forever. We've looked, yes, at the sovereign's generosity. But secondly tonight, I want you to see the Spirit's guidance. The Spirit's guidance. There's another word that's used in verse number 2 that has caused almost as much controversy as have the words foreknowledge and election. It is the word sanctification. Not much is mentioned today about the subject or topic of sanctification, yet it is still in the Word of God, and it must still be preached, and it must still be taught And I'm going to say this with a smile on my face tonight and and without any mean spirit about me at all. We need to hear more about sanctification and we need to be people who practice being sanctified. You say, well, Pastor, I'm not sure that I know what that means. I'm glad you asked. We're going to look at what it means tonight. According to Vine's Expository Dictionary, Sanctification is that relationship with God which men enter into by faith in Jesus Christ. It's on the monitors for you to see this tonight, but according to Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, sanctification is that relationship with God which men enter into by faith in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is is also used in the New Testament of the separation, listen to me carefully tonight, of the separation of believers from evil things and evil ways. Now, I want that to 
sink down into your ears and make its way all the way to your heart tonight. Separation of believers from evil things and evil ways. Sanctification is God's will for the believer. It must be learned from God as he teaches it by his word. John 17, 17 reminds us, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here's what we need to get tonight. We understand that the Spirit of God is showing the child of God the ways in which they are and are not supposed to walk in this present world. Did you hear me tonight? That the Spirit of God is saying to the child of God the ways in which they are and are not supposed to walk in this present world. Now, I, I have to stop right here, and I, I do pray that you'll listen with an open heart tonight, because it used to be that pastors would stand in pulpits and that they would hammer on certain things and that they would address even the way in which we are supposed to live and churches would even amen and shout and praise the Lord and that's right. And today you start doing that and as I have said recently, people are ready to form a new pastor search committee when that starts happening. Because let a pastor... Stand behind a pulpit and say that Christians should not be consuming alcohol. That Christians should not be living immoral lives. That Christians should not be doing this. And Christians should not be doing that. And people begin to say, well, I don't know if I agree with that. You know, this is 2023. We need to be more open-minded. You know, the problem today is that some people have been so open-minded, their brains have fallen out. And listen to me, it's happening in church. Because, oh, pastor, don't say that. You're going to run people off. Oh, don't say that. You're going to offend the wrong family in church. Oh, don't say that, because if you do, our offerings are going to go down. Listen, I'm responsible to God for what I say and what I preach. And as long as I'm in this book, listen to me carefully. This church is supposed to follow what I preach and teach as long as I'm in this book, Brother Chris. I get out of the book, then we have a problem. Then we have a problem. But as long as what I'm preaching lines up with this book, we're supposed to agree with it and we're supposed to follow it. I, I have a pastor friend of mine that is, uh, and I actually do have some of those, uh, just, to, just to clarify that. I have a pastor friend of mine that is dealing with an issue in the church where he pastors, uh, and he, uh, he even hearkened back to something that I heard years ago uh, when, when he said to me recently that he's afraid that, that he's going to basically be asked to leave his church because he's taking a stand against the sin that's present in his church. Uh, he reminded me of something that I heard from years ago. He said, I think I may go ahead and tell them, though, it would be easier for them to move their letter because I've already moved my furniture. <laughs> Listen very carefully. We need to be people who sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, and we need to be people who attempt to live sanctified lives. You say, oh, pastor, you're, you're becoming a fruit inspector and you're becoming a judge of what we do and what we don't do. Listen, I'm not your judge. One far greater than I is your judge. The Word of God judges us daily. And the Spirit of God convicts us of things that we do and that we do not do. Now that we've been adopted into the family of God and purchased by the blood of the Son of God, we should live according to the dictates of the Word of God. Yes, we see the Sovereign's generosity. We see the Spirit's guidance. Thirdly, tonight, we are now shown the Son's graciousness. 
Peter finishes verse 2 with a phrase that we've heard from the Apostle Paul many times. He speaks about grace unto you and peace be multiplied. But do not all of these people already have grace? And was it not given to them when they accepted Christ as their Savior? Well, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. When they asked Christ into their heart, they experienced saving grace. But there is more than just one side to grace. I need you to hear me carefully. Don't go out of here saying something that I didn't say. There is saving grace, but Brother Larry, there's also keeping grace. There is sustaining grace. There is sufficient grace. There is guiding grace. There is protecting grace. There is providing grace. God's grace is amazing, and it is multifaceted in how he gives grace on top of grace on top of grace to us. In fact, maybe some of you might even remember a, a song uh, that goes along the lines of how that there has been grace for every trial, there has been grace for every mile, and then that there will even be new grace when it's my time to die. You see, God does give us grace in different measures at different times based on what's going on in our lives. Let me explain what I mean by that. A family member goes through a horrible disease and you wonder how you're going to be able to deal with it. And yet every day God is giving grace to be able to cope and be able to get through it. A friend or family member again dies tragically or even after an extended illness and you don't know how you're going to be able to get through it. But God gives grace to get through it. We find, yes, the son's graciousness. And not only does Peter desire that these believers have grace, check this out tonight, he also desires for them to have peace. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is the joy of knowing that your sins are forgiven, that you have a home in heaven, and that God is taking care of your every need. That, ladies and gentlemen, is true peace. Did you know that you can lay your head on your pillow at night, even though there may be a storm brewing around you, you can still lay your head on your pillow at night because of God giving grace and peace to you. Peter wants these two aspects of the Christian life to not only be evident in the lives of the believers, but did you notice what he said in verse number 2? Look back at it with me again real quick. Grace unto you and peace be, help me tonight church, multiplied. Well, I, I like certain words in the way that they, they are given to us by the Spirit of God in the Word of God. It, it's not, Brother Larry, that he just wants them to be present. And he doesn't just even want grace and peace to be added. He wants grace and peace to be multiplied in our lives. Exponentially, even. The idea that is being given here is that grace and peace would be overflowing in their lives. I ask you again tonight, and I say this lovingly, are grace and peace overflowing in your life? We've looked at the sovereign's generosity. We've looked at the Spirit's, guide, the Spirit's guidance. We've looked at the Son's graciousness. And that now brings us to the final thought at which we will look tonight, dealing with the saints' growth. The saints' growth. In 1 Peter 1 3, we are told, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Boy, uh, Peter 
again, gives us all kinds of things at which to look and to study. In his opening words, Peter has briefly outlined God's great plan of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. He has shown this glorious truth from election before the foundation of the world to the believers experiencing of both grace and peace being multiplied in their lives. But in verse 3, it is as if Peter is pausing to simply say, thank God. Everybody look up for a minute. And, and, and I, I want to ask this as genuinely as I know how to tonight. Have there been those times and places in your lives where you have stopped and just in the midst of everything else that's gone on, you've just stopped and you've looked up to heaven and you've said, God, thank you. Thank you for not giving me what I do deserve. And thank you for giving to me what I don't deserve. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for blessing my family. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for providing for me. I believe that Peter has been so moved by the thought of God's plan of redemption, how the Spirit presents it, how the Son purchased it, that he pauses to give glory and honor to the one to whom it is due. So hear me clearly on this tonight, and you can, you can run me out of the synagogue on this one later on if you feel so in, impressed to do such. One of the greatest sins that can be committed in the life of the child of God is the sin of ingratitude. One of the greatest sins is the sin of ingratitude. As those who were once sinners and who were on our way to hell, but who are now saved and on our way to heaven, we should always have an attitude of gratitude. Did you hear me tonight? You say, well, pastor, this is going on, and this is going on, and this is happening, and I I don't even have a clue as to everything that's being experienced by every individual or every family. But I do know this, that regardless of how bad it gets, God has still been good. God has still been good. We still have it good no matter how bad it gets. However you want to phrase that, however you want to look at it, God's been good. If you never get to see another rainbow, if you never get to walk another, another day along the beach, if you never get to see uh, another starry-filled sky at night, God's still been good. He still poured out blessing upon blessing upon blessing. It's so interesting to me. We have one day a year that we set aside for Thanksgiving. And with all due respect, I think maybe we have it completely reversed. Because it's as if, oh, on that one day a year, we're going to stop and we're going to say the things for which we're thankful. And the other 364 days a year, Brother Larry, we complain. Listen to me carefully. Every day should be a Thanksgiving day in the life of a Christian. Every day. Listen to what David said in Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, we would read, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Listen to me. You want to know what God's will is for your life? It's God's will that you give thanks. You see it. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you in everything. Give thanks. In verse 3, we see Peter speaking of the abundant mercy of God. And again, it would be wonderful in itself if Peter had just spoken of the mercy of God. 
But the Spirit of God was careful to give Peter the exact words that should be written in order to show us how merciful God is. For God does not just have mercy. Listen, he has abundant mercy. The word abundant has this meaning. And I I love this. It means plentiful. In great supply, fully sufficient, overflowing. Did you see it tonight? God's mercy is abundant. That means it is plentiful. That means it is in great supply. That means it is fully sufficient. That means it is overflowing. We ought to be thankful for God's abundant mercy. Maybe that's why David would speak of the mercy of the Lord so often. Listen to how he addresses it through Psalm 103. And I'm I'm going to read several verses, so just bear with me if you would. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine thine iniquities, excuse me, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Pay close attention to this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us After our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Man, call a time out right there and shout for half an hour. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Hey, I I want you to know something tonight. We ought to be thankful for the mercy of God. We also see that the Lord has begotten us again to a lively hope. Did you see that in verse number 3? 1 Peter chapter 1. You'll notice that the hope that we have, and I'm going to get just a, a little bit excited about this. The hope that we have is not dead. It is alive. Why is the hope alive? Because Jesus is alive. Why should Christians be the happiest, most lively people that there has ever been? Because Jesus is alive and because he has begotten us to a lively hope. Don't be a dead Christian. Don't be sitting on a pew waiting for the rapture and saying, well, I guess I'll enjoy my Christianity when I get there. I'll just endure it now. No, we have a lively hope. The rest of the world should look at us and see that there's something different. We have a living hope. Even even the dead in Christ, get this tonight, even the dead in Christ have a living hope. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13 We read, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Brother Chris, even the dead in Christ have a living hope. Uh, That seems kind of counterproductive or somewhat of an oxymoron, but even the dead in Christ have a living hope. In Hebrews 6, we're told that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. We have a hope that is steadfast and sure, Scripture would tell us. In fact, in Hebrews 7, verse 19, We read, For the law made nothing perfect, 
but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. I'm thankful for God's amazing grace, God's abundant mercy, and the lively hope that we have in Christ. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, thank you again.